Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about ethical issues uh, in CPR. So, what are the ethical issues that you usually encounter during CPR? So, this includes when to start CPR, when to stop the CPR, when not to start CPR, and how about if family members request to be with the patient during the resuscitation. We are going to highlight those issues during our presentation. When we talk about ethical issue during CPR, we have to remember some key principles of the ethics. This includes autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, dignity and honesty, and when we hold and withdraw the therapy. First, I'll talk about patient autonomy. It means the right of the patient to accept or refuse the treatment that we offer. This includes CPR as well. But this only applies to those who are capable of making the decision with the right state of mind. The decision should be made on understanding of the disease itself and what is the condition of the patient at that time and the treatments that we are going to offer and whether there's other uh, alternative uh, therapy that can help and the risk and benefit of receiving and also refusing the treatment actually. Whenever we're going to initiate a CPR on a patient, we should always weigh the risk and benefit of the CPR on the patient actually. So we have to think, are we doing patient good or are we doing patient more harm by just delaying death and prolonging the suffering for the patient. For example, a patient of 85 years old came in with a recurrent CVA and already have a bed sore, already bed bound for the past five years, came in with autostatic pneumonia and septic shock, and came in gasping. So are we going to initiate the CPR on the patient? Will the CPR help the patient or actually prolong the suffering of the patient? So we have to think twice before we actually initiate the CPR if patient goes into cardiac arrest. Remember to do no harm or any further harm. Hence, CPR should not be initiated in fertile cases. For example, a patient with an allergic MVA brought in death with crushed brain injury. Are we going to CPR the patient? Of course, no. Being as a frontliner, we also have the duty to actually distribute the limited healthcare resources equally within the society. However, the decision of who actually gets the treatment plays a very essential role. We want the person who has the higher chance of survival to get the best resources that are available. The person who has the worst outcome, we have to think twice before we actually initiate a CPR and actually utilize the limited resources that we actually have in our hand. Always remember to treat patients with dignity and be honest to the patients and also the relative. They deserve to know their conditions and their treatments that we are going to offer to them and the risk and benefit of the treatments, choices, and they, it's their right to make the choice. We should not hide the information for what we want for the patient instead of what they want for themselves. Regarding living will or the wishes for end-of-life care from the patient himself or herself is also part of the, uh, uh, the decision-making uh, factors, whether we will initiate CPR or not. Let's say a patient with no case of lung CA, stage 4 with multiple metastases, non-responsive to treatment, already decided and tell the family member that he or she doesn't want any active resuscitation if his day of cardiac arrest arrives. So by all means, we should respect that decision. However, not all situations are the same. It based on uh, different situation and periodic consideration needed as the patient desire, desire and condition can change. For another instance, Let's say a very ill patient who is admitted to the ward for some pneumonia, okay, came with septic shock, okay, but uh, it was very ill, and the uh, patient and the family member had decided if anything happened to the patient, uh, they do not want resuscitation. But 
after the treatment, patient actually responded to the treatment. Okay, let's say uh, on the day 8 of the treatment, patient already recovering out of any inotropic support or vasopressor and patient is already quite well. Let's say suddenly goes into cardiac arrest. Example, develop a VF because of cardiac problem. The change, the condition is changed. All right? We should resuscitate the patient at that point of time. It doesn't mean that when the patient came in initially in a critically ill patient, uh, condition, patient decided not for CPR. But patient has improved. The condition had changed. So, meaning that DI, DNAR should be renewed from time to time based on the condition of the patient and also patient's desire. Some patients came in with unconscious condition who are incapable of making the decision whether they want to be actively resuscitated or not. So the decision will force on the closest family member, which is the nominated decision maker, right? Uh, and normally are the spouse, okay, the child, okay, uh, but who is adult and the parents, the closest relative that available. It cannot be like friends or neighbor of the patients because this is all medical legal and whenever we explain to the family member, they should understand fully what is the condition of the patient, what is the best thing to be done for the patient and the risk and benefit of the treatment and also the CPR that we are going to provide to the patient. Regarding medical fertility, we are talking about whether an intervention that we are going to provide to patient, including CPR, going to be beneficial or not for the patient. We are talking about the quality of life of the patient that uh, will have after the patient regains spontaneous circulation. Let's say uh, a patient with a severe traumatic brain injury came in GCS, GCS of 3 and pupil bilaterally fixed dilated, patient still having spontaneous circulation and you incubated the patient. And after CT brain, you noted there's a very bad brain with generalized cerebral edema, Right. If the patient goes into cardiac arrest and you CPR the patient, will it be beneficial for the patient or not? What about the quality of life that patient is going to have if patient staying alive? Right. So we should consider all this okay, before we actually uh, actively resuscitate a patient. Let's say the prognosis is uncertain. Of course, a trial of treatment can be considered. For example, a severe head injury patient, okay, whether they, they want to go for conservative or uh, they want to go actively, uh, uh, active treatment, okay, they might try uh, give a trial of mannitol or hypertonic saline to reduce the cerebral edema and reassess the power of the patient. If patients do improve, the pupils from fixed dilated become reactive. All right, we know that this patient has the likelihood of surviving, then by all means, go actively. But if the patient do not respond and patient is deteriorating, we know that the survival chance is very, very low. So to initiate a CPR or not, when the patient goes into cardiac arrest, we should think twice and we should explain to the family member and discuss with the family member before that moment come. So when not to start a CPR? This includes if there is already a living will from the patients or surrogate decision maker and there's a valid DNAR by the attending physician, there's an obvious sign of death. Patient already rigomotis, all right? Algomotis, okay? And the injuries that is incompatible with life. Let's say the body is cut into half, all right? That kind of injury is incompatible with life, right? Or crushed brain injury, that's, those injuries are the ones that is on incompatible with life. So we should not initiate CPR in those patients. When not to stop, okay, some situations such as drug intoxication that we have antidotes, hypothermia patient, we should re, uh, we should warm the patient up, okay, and VF. We should shock the patient because uh, we know uh, patient in VF have uh, high chances of survival, up to 70% if we initiate the resuscitation and also the defibrillation as soon as possible. So when to stop CPR? 
First, when there's already R and C, so we should stop the CPR. Second, if the resuscitator is too exhausted to continue or too dangerous for him or she to continue resuscitating. Third, if there's already obvious signs of death on the patient. However, the decision to stop resuscitation are often made from case to case basis, actually. So depends on the condition of the patients. Okay, depends on the comorbidities and pre-morbidly, how was the patient, the patient wills, the family wills, and also the decision made by the team leader and the experience of the team leader. Before I end my presentation, I also want to bring up the issues of having family members to be at the side of the patient during the resuscitation process. So, Actually, we found that the acceptance of the family member actually would be better when they actually witness the CPR and they know that we are giving our full effort in resuscitating their loved one. However, there are a few things that you have to be careful before you allow the family members to come in to be at the site and actually witness the resuscitation process. During the initial phase of the resuscitation, when you are intubating the patient, when you are calling for help, when you do not have enough staff, those are the times that the family member should not be there. But you can actually have someone to inform the family member that the CPR is ongoing, their family members, is uh, the patient is critically ill, get them mentally prepared. Before you bring them in, please do inform them regarding the resuscitation condition. The patient already intubated, there will be a tube in the mouth and the CPR on the chest, right? the condition of the patient is very ill. So you get them mentally prepared, do not give them any false hope. Tell them the real condition and the situation of the patient and the worst outcome that may have. And you also have to let your team member know that the family member is coming in, so they are doing their best during the resuscitations. Okay? Then only you allow the family member to be with the family, uh, with the patient, okay, during the resuscitation process. This will create a situation where the family member actually understand that uh, the condition of the patient, the progress of the patient, the effort they were already put in. However, if the patient goes, uh, if the patient pass away, they can accept it even better. With this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.